Okay. Well, very good. I am so very uh, honored to be with you guys again and to uh, be a part of uh, Community Circle and also to be able to speak on this really, I think, um, wonderful uh, ministry that you have been providing for everybody in the church in terms of doing a disciples toolkit and and exploring um, all of the sacraments that we have in Community of Christ, the special sacraments that we recognize in Community of Christ. I think that um, a lot of times in the church, because we a lot of us exist in very small congregations that uh, have had the members that have been members together for years and years, um, we end up doing things according to like our own little traditions and we and we never actually describe what we're doing, why we're doing it, where that came from. And in a lot of cases, we may not know any of those answers. Um, and so it is especially difficult to be invitational because um, a, a new person will come into the congregation and no matter how, how much we all smile and even talk to them and what are, well, are welcoming, if we are, if we are like that, not every congregation has managed that, but even, even, even if we are being very welcoming in that way, we aren't always welcoming in the sense of trying to explain the weirdness that we are to them, <laughs> you know, how, explain why, why are these things important to us? What are, where do they come from? And so, um, in my own congregation, because we, uh, through the online ministry Beyond the Walls, because we continuously have um, people who engage our services who have never been involved in a community Christ service before, so they will come on and they will be able to watch that on the YouTube channel. Um, we're now in a place in the Beyond the Walls ministry where we have over 5 million views on the YouTube channel. And so as a result of that, there are so many people, the majority of people who have watched one of our recordings are not members of the church and they are not familiar with the church and they are being exposed to the church for the first time. And so we try to tell anyway, our ministers who are giving the various components of the service, please, um, explain what we're doing. <laughs> Don't just go directly into a jargon term that uh, we maybe is as longtime members understand, but people who in the audience are not longtime members would have no clue what we're talking about. If we want to welcome them, if we want to invite them, if we want to include them, we have to um, do this kind of explanation. And so this kind of ministry the Community Circle is doing is I think especially vital for the work of being truly welcoming and invitational. Um, and so it's actually sometimes complicated to even learn about these things. And so I, I welcome the opportunity to have uh, doing this dive down into the sacrament of the blessing of children. I'm gonna go to share my screen here and see if that works. Set this up so everyone can thumbs up. They're seeing the the slide. So um, we're talking today on the and as part of the series of sacraments in Community of Christ, the sacrament of the blessing of children. And I appreciate that you guys have been using all of these unofficial icons <laughs> that we created in the Toronto cool. congregation um, for. Um, we, we, we have, I'm a visual learner. <laughs> and, uh, and so I loved right from the start in terms of memorizing the mission initiatives that there were five icons, you know, that, that went along with each of those mission initiatives. Um, but as I was trying to, you know, uphold to new members or new investigators, people who are coming into the church and the congregation for the first time, uh, the nine enduring principles, having a list of nine things in my head, it was not easy, it didn't work well. So we created nine icons for those, uh, which were later adopted and adapted by World Church to become official. We have set, done the same thing for the eight sacraments. Uh, those have not become official yet, but you can spread the word and maybe headquarters will eventually adapt and adopt these. Um, the uh, the way it kind of works right now, just visually, the um, the, mission initiatives are in circles, the enduring principles are in squares, and I've made the sacraments in little octagons. It's not to say that they're a stop sign, <laughs> but, but rather because there's eight of them, uh, and it sort of represents the, um, the, if you've ever been in the temple, in the meditation chapel of the temple, it's an octagon with paintings of the eight sacraments 
uh, on the on the walls of that special sacred space in the temple. So that's a space that's sort of representing a sacramental chapel. And so um, I thought visually it makes sense to uh, have our sacraments in the little octagons uh, as opposed to the circles or squares for the others. So this is a fun uh, and joyous sacrament. <laughs> you know, some of the sacraments are um, are are, hap are happening, which are, are, are hope giving in times of, of extreme uh, crisis or troubles that people are having. And in this case, usually um, the sacrament of the blessing of children is one of the ones in the church that I think we uh, we celebrate, um, you know, pretty much most joyously and with probably the most hope that you can have. Um, uh, you know there are other ones that are like that too so we're i'm going to be officiating at a wedding this um uh saturday which will also be a very joyous and wonderful occasion for the uh the two women who have been longtime participants and uh with their children in the community of christ and now are being married together uh, which we'll do on saturday so this is the sacrament of the blessing children we just barely had one of these um on September 24th. So the couple here are um, uh, Jacob and Alexandra Scriven, who um, Alexandra is a uh, lifelong member of the church, member of the congregation. And uh, this is their first child, Piper Shirley Scriven. And, uh, and the child that was born also conceived and born after a uh, long, long uh, complications in terms of fertility issues and things and so for them it was also um, all children are a blessing and a miracle but they also recognize this as a special um, blessing and miracle and a joy uh, that Piper was born uh, and so in such a wonderful and healthy way and so forth and so we were able to have this very blessed event and so it's quite fresh in my mind the sacrament of the blessing of children since we've just barely um, celebrated one in my congregation. So as we talked about, we um, recognize eight special sacraments in community of Christ. Um, of course, there are any number of um, spiritual practices that can be done that can be very meaningful. Um, there are all sorts of um, spiritual practices that you know, are not, you know, should not be, you know, we're, not, we're not denigrating those by not calling them sacraments, you know, we can be doing um, sp uh, spiritual practices that include things like, um, like meditation can be a spiritual practice that can bring us closer to God. And, and, and there are other, kind anyway, any number of these that are amazing spiritual practices, one that we were just um, participating in uh, uh, recently, and we do kind of frequently here in Canada is the meditative labyrinth walk, and so this is where you have a kind of a labyrinth and as you are entering into it and going out, it's a time to, of, uh, of reflection uh, that you can have, a time when you can be listening to God and what God is saying. We're not, we're, we're having essentially a kind of silent but moving silent meditation and there's a labyrinth that's built into the temple so that people are able to uh, have that. It's also uh, very frequently in Christian history, those are also built into the floors of cathedrals. So as you are traveling around in pilgrimage in Europe, you can um, go into those and have that practice. So anyway, there are many of those, but they're not recognized or set apart by the church as special um, spiritual practices that are recognized um, as, as sacraments. We have had in the tradition um, the word sacrament and also the word ordinance. Um, and, I, and we have more recently been saying sacrament, although in the past we used to say ordinance more. And so I've had, when I've talked to members of my congregation, many of whom have been around a long time, um, they remember both of those terms. Um, the term actually, uh, the, a, the, the terms actually, we kind of use them interchangeably, and, the, and um, but uh, there's an actual purpose behind them. Originally um, in Western Christianity, um, sacraments uh, had this idea that the word sacrament is a, a practice that is sacred, a practice that is connecting us to God, connecting us to the divine. Um, but during the time period of the uh, Reformation, when um, people in Northern uh, Europe especially um, broke with the Western Latin Catholic Church, what became the what becomes now known as the Catholic Church, um, they wanted to, um, 
purge some practices from the church that they felt were in need of reform. And one of them was a concern that they had anyway, that, um, that too much ritual had crept in and that it was misassociated or misunderstood by some Christians, some members as being sort of like a magic practice as opposed to um, being a, a, a spiritual practice. In other words, that somehow the magic is involved is what they um, was the argument, the partisan argument that let's say the Protestants are making. Um, and so, for example, even we have the word in English um, when people are doing a, a, you know, a magic trick or something like that, they'll say hocus pocus. And, and, and saying hocus pocus is like saying, you know, out, you know, it's just like saying abracadabra or whatever, but, yeah. but the word hocus pocus um, is actually a corruption of hoke est, um, you know, hoke est, uh, what does it say, poke est, po anyway, it, it, potence, you know, here is, here is the, 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 uh, the body of Christ, right, in other words, it's what the priest says, in a in a in the in the communion in the Eucharist sacrament, and so and so what the um, Protestants argued was rather than calling these special practices sacraments, we're just going to call them ordinances, which means to say there's nothing um, inherently let's say set apart or more sacred about them. They are simply things that Jesus ordained to be done in his ministry. So an ordinance is actually meaning to take the sacredness out of it and making it more like a, a ritual that is done in remembrance of Jesus as opposed to um, an expression of sacred, let's say sacredness or sacred power or something. And so that's the original difference. I think in Community of Christ, we have, um, uh, in the in the even in the restoration tradition, the meaning of that got switched around so that ordinance started to be seen as being more of a um, again meaning having the meaning of taking on the meaning of sacrament. And so in community of Christ, um, we've reverted to the the actual word sacrament. And so anyway, that's kind of just a little background by why we call these sacraments and set them apart. Um, the eight that are recognized are kind of um, done so on the one plan. Um, like everything in the church is a little bit of it's based on our weird trajectory of our own history why these particular ones got recognized and other things didn't it may well be um, so for example in uh, other traditions uh, there is a there is a sacrament that is around for example death last rites or a eulogy could be considered a sacrament we don't really have one for for death um, and, you know, you could just as easily imagine having one and having that because that is one of the things that as uh, a life, a change of life, a life, um, one of these great life events that might be marked by a sacrament, but in this case uh, is not uh, in our tradition. So the sacraments we have are blessing of children, baptism, confirmation, the Lord's Supper, the laying on of hands, the evangelist blessing, ordination and marriage. Um, of these, the Lord's Supper, I would say, is kind of the only one that's sort of set apart as a part of the regular life of the church, which is to say regular meaning that's repeated on a schedule. And so traditionally, in most Community of Christ congregations, this is celebrated monthly and traditionally on the first Sunday of the month, although um, other congregations have traditions where they do it more or less frequently. Um, and so um, there are some congregations that are new and online congregations where they will have practiced the sacrament of the Lord's Supper every time they meet, which might be, you know, weekly even, so more than monthly. That's completely um, possible. It's not like there's a there's not a rule on this. It's just a tradition. Um, and then also, um, I've heard recently of congregations where they where they practice this quarterly as opposed to monthly. And so I thought, whoa, okay. <laughs> you know, that that's that's different from how we do it, but that's fine. You know, in other words, it's not um, there's not a rule about that. But the idea of it is, is like I'm saying, is this is one, this is one that we were doing on a regular basis. And it's kind of the um, let's say continual upkeep of the life of the church as opposed to um, ones that are set apart at a particular life events that are one time or something like that, or at particular times as opposed to regular times. And so in a lot of the cases then the other sacraments are sort of designed to recognize significant events in a person's life in the life of the disciple. So for us, 
The blessing of children is obviously one that it, we do generally at birth or infancy, essentially young childhood, child children, celebrating with children um, in their earliest stage of life, anytime actually under the age of eight, but usually fairly early. Um, we have ourselves in our practice baptism and confirmation in the case of children born in the church. Obviously, we also have uh, adult uh, convert baptism and conversion. Um, but for people born in the church, this is a childhood ordinance usually. So it requires child is required to be eight and some it's usually done around then or within a few years of turning eight. So in other words, recognizing um, that when a infant is a baby, you're in a stage of life where we're celebrating pretty much as a community, as parents and so forth, but the baby is not going to remember that. Whereas once you get to eight, this is where you're the beginning of when you, as a uh, individual person, will start to form memories. And so people, generally speaking, are able to remember their own baptism when it occurs at age eight. Uh, and confirmation is usually immediately thereafter. Um, Obviously, we have the sacrament of marriage, which uh, is when, again, a major life stage. You go, in some cases, from being, a lot of times now, marriage is not as early as it used to be in our tradition, certainly in Europe and in North America. Um, so you were often an independent adult and having been living on your own and maybe even living with a partner and so forth a different, for a different amount of this stage in life. But it as traditionally, essentially, at a moment when you are forming a family together with a partner, uh, and making then that special covenant uh, and sacrament, and the sacrament is there to recognize that. Another life transition is consecrating one's own life as a disciple to further ministry, so whether you are sacrament of ordination to priesthood. And so those are ones that more or less happen. Um, I mean, marriage can happen more than once, but you know, so generally speaking, more more or less happening, and ordinations can happen in in succession successive callings, but they're uh, happening at a particular life moment. And on top of that, we have um, uh, two sacraments that are happening not on a regular basis, but in times of particular need. So, for example, the sacrament of the laying on of hands, whenever a person is in a personal need, spiritual need of healing, spiritually need of comfort for physical uh, illness and so forth. And then the evangelist blessing, which is uh, originally was held only done once in life, but now, um, as I think very wonderfully evolved to be under to be at any kind of major life transition moment where you are feeling the need for um, special reflection and inspired counsel you can turn to um, an evangelist who's usually a very senior minister who is able to help you with a blessing to help in that time of life transition so um, a special sacrament indeed so along with that and that evangelist blessing the blessing, uh, the honoring, which is uh, what our understanding of honoring the blessing of children as a sacrament is pretty unique to our tradition. So other um, Christians will bless children um, and many religious traditions bless children or give blessings to children. But the fact that we call it a sacrament and set it apart as one of the special sacraments of the church is unique. So most Christian denominations actually baptize infants. And so they therefore have the sacrament of baptism for children born in their tradition and that is essentially covering you know sacramentally covering that life stage since we delay the baptism of children to eight um, we have that kind of gap and so that's one of the reasons why maybe there is a kind of a a need or a at least there was an opportunity to have a sacrament here in our tradition for the blessing of children um, so in the case of uh of most denominations that baptize infants, um, they usually do not then immediately have a confirmation. Confirmation becomes the kind of childhood um, uh, stage of sacramental stage. In other words, the sacrament that recognizes that you're now come to a place in childhood where you can uh, have memories, you can learn about the tradition of your church and maybe, um, maybe memorize uh, bits of doctrine or creeds if they have creeds in that case. And so in those cases, then um, a child, child will be confirmed at 12 or something like that um, as, a, as part of their tradition, as opposed to doing both of them together the way we usually do. 
So there, so in talking about this, I've, I've kind of mentioned essentially what we have, which is a division that Christians have over baptism, and you have a toolkit, so a, a speech or a lecture on baptism already, so I don't need to go into a lot of detail on this, but essentially since the beginning, um, Christians have been of two minds usually about how baptism should be practiced and so um, originally of course all of the disciples are adult converts because nobody had been uh, a follower of Jesus until Jesus began a movement a movement that eventually evolved into churches um, but and at a certain point very quickly um, people who are already considering themselves Christians who had already been baptized let's say as adults and had a believer's adult baptism, they started having kids and they want their kids to be part of the congregation and how does that work? And so that has been, um, you know, essentially there's been two different opinions, all the, all going all the way back, should um, you, the children born in the church have the same kind of a conversion experience where they um, uh, are able as adults to say, yes, I'm, I'm want to commit to new life in Christ. And that's been called a believer's baptism, which is practiced generally speaking traditionally uh, uh, where adults are baptized or um, is it can you just baptize infants and children uh, and and essentially have um, parents or in godparents stand with the child to say we appreciate that the kid is too is too little now to understand what they're doing here but they will be raised by a congregation they will be raised by parents and godparents who are going to see that they achieve that level of training and teaching and so forth that will allow them to have the same experience that an adult convert would have on being baptized and so those are essentially the two uh different um ways of looking at it and although um Although there's, I think, good points that can be made on both sides, both sides, generally speaking, are very antagonistic to each other in Christianity and decide that our, our way is the right way and, and, uh, and, and your way is the wrong way. Uh, we in the restoration tradition have kind of a compromise position, which is this eight, eight year old and calling the you're being eight age of accountability. So the an eight year old obviously is not an adult who was able to, um, you know, make their own let's say independent decision really yet uh, the way an adult believer's baptism would be they are all not an infant who won't remember the experience but this is a is done kind of in between uh, which is neither one nor the other in a way but is our own particular um, tradition which is interesting but it is also um, you know one where we are in, are just as committed to it I think as everybody else is for their understanding of it and this is uh, um, been a complication for, for example, even as we have recognized other Christian baptisms and allow people to become members through confirmation, um, we have not uh, recognized Christian baptisms below the age of eight, um, although that is something that the World Conference will be considering, uh, you know, bringing to the First Presidency in one of the resolutions uh, next year, uh, whether or not to reconsider recognition of that that would not change how we perform baptism but would change how we recognize other christian baptisms so so what's the origin of this sacrament the sacrament of the blessing of children in some sense like i said i suggested already there's sort of a um a, a market uh gap you just to say um, nature abhors a vacuum so you move baptism away from infants and then you what do you do with infants you know and so in that, in that sense maybe is one of the origins of it is simply having that space available but let's look at it so in our tradition of course the church was originally organized under the name church of christ on april 6 1830 so the first members who came together in upstate new york um, they were Christian primitivists, which means to, which means essentially that they um, were committed to trying to restore the way Christianity was practiced by the primitive. We don't use the word primitive this way anymore because now we kind of think of primitives as being like cavemen. But primitive just meant earliest. And so how the earliest Christians, the apostolic church, we might sometimes say, how the apostolic church um, immediately in the wake of Jesus's, in the book of Acts, as described in the book of Acts, in, in the wake of Jesus's uh, death and resurrection, how were they living as Christians? And so um, in order to achieve that, 
Um, they, they studied the New Testament really closely and they tried to see, um, you know, what are the sorts of things that New Testament Christians are doing? What are they, what are they sorts of, um, uh, what are the sorts of, let's say, offices or titles that they're holding? How are they exercising um, um, priesthood? How, did, how are all of those things understood or described in the New Testament? And that becomes the initial basis for how the Restoration Church, uh, the Church of Christ, it's even called Church of Christ, because um, there is no there's no, they don't can't, when they're reading the New Testament, nobody's talking about a Methodist church or a Presbyterian church or even a Catholic church. They are talking about, you can read it, sometimes it'll say Christian church, it'll sometimes say Church of Christ, and it'll sometimes say Church of God. And so they want to have a name like that because only the original church would have been called something like that, as opposed to uh, the different denominational names that had become into being as of the 19th century. So, um, one of the places they saw it, they read in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, uh, they read, people were bringing children to Jesus in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant, and he said to the disciples, let the children come to me, do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took the children up in his arms, he laid hands on them, and he blessed them. So um, Jesus here overturns the expectations of his adult disciples, which he's more or less continuously doing in the, in the narration in the Gospel of Mark. In the Gospel of Mark, the disciples are pretty thick-headed usually, and uh, just as Jesus has to reprimand them all the time, they always are complaining that they don't understand what he's talking about, and so on. This is another example. Uh, uh, and Jesus then is also showing here that his ministry, his inclusive ministry, is also explicitly inclusive of children, and even stating here that God's kingdom uh, the movement that he is founding uh, belongs to children. And so when our earliest members, restoration members, which are actively scanning biblical texts to find practices here, they are seeing a, a potential, let's say, ordinance, this thing that Jesus is ordaining to be done, which is take, having little children come, laying hands on them, and blessing them. And so this is a, um, a precedent or a model or an example as they are looking for things that Christians uh, should do in emulating Jesus. The restoration members also have a further example of Jesus doing this, which they have from their New Testament of Scripture, New New Testament of Scripture, the Book of Mormon, which is published right at the same time at the beginning of the church. And so we read um, in 3 Nephi 8.12, uh, we have the LDS versification here always too. So when Jesus appears in the Book of Mormon peoples, he blesses the children. So here's what we read. It came to pass that he commanded that their little children should be brought. So they brought their little children and set them down upon the ground round about him. And Jesus stood in the midst and the multitude gave way uh, till they had all been brought unto him. So then he not, has everyone who assembled as doing that kneel together, and he offers this prayer, and um, the, the writer here, Nephi, acts, waxes eloquently. This is a great and marvelous things were said, as such as can never even be uh, spoken by man, and indeed can't be written down. And so he's more or less saying, you, got, you had to be there, <laughs> but it was an amazing uh, spiritual and joyous experience. So then after saying that prayer, the multitude is overcome with joy, and then Jesus has them stand back up, and he says, blessed are ye because of your faith, and now behold, my joy is full. And so he concludes the narrative here. When he had said these words, he wept, and the multitude bear record of it, and he took their little children one by one, and he blessed them, and he prayed unto the Father for them. And when he'd done this, he wept again. And he spake unto the multitude and saith unto them, Behold your little ones. And as they look to behold, they cast their eyes towards heaven, and they saw the heavens open, so they have a shared visionary experience, and they saw angels descending out of heaven, as it were, in the midst of fire, and they came down and encircled those little ones about, 
and they they were encircled about with fire and the angels did minister unto them and the multitude to see and hear and bear record and they were in number about 2,500 souls and they did consist of men women and children so there is a a practice here where Jesus um, blesses one by one again all of the children um, and and there's a, a visionary experience that essentially confirms then that this uh, that 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 results in the children being having receiving a gift of ministering of angels. So, um, in those in addition to those precedents, uh, the church had uh, an additional source for information and answers as they were trying to figure out how to live as primitive Christians lived. They were able to ask. God uh, directly, and then Joseph Smith, acting in his role as prophet of the church, would answer with uh, where where the kind of questions were still lacking, where there's no biblical precedence. And so this began before the church was organized during the Book of Mormon dictation process. And so uh, Joseph Smith would directly ask the Lord, and then he would channel the prophetic voice and dictate uh, responses. Those responses are initially uh, referred to as commandments, and they later we sometimes call them revelations, and now we usually say inspired counsel. So an important commandment, as it was originally called, came around the time of the church's organization, and this uh, kind of lengthy um, thing that is going to talk about how the church should be organized and operated and what the uh, officers and what the priesthood roles and what the sacraments should sort of be is called the articles and covenants of the church and that becomes chapter 24 in the book of commandments which is the original uh, book that takes those commandments what we now say the covenants like in the doctrine and covenants takes those um, books of those uh, texts of inspired counsel um, we now use them in the book of the doctrine and covenants the original one was the book of commandments um, later, uh, this same section was heavily edited, and it became section two of the original 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, and so that's now DNC section 17. Um, the, they're all moved around, but anyway, I'm just go ahead and I'm going to quote from the original. It's been edited, and it's not quite like this in the um, in the current DNC, but actually, it doesn't change the meaning of it. Doesn't change much in this case. So um, it's now, uh, like I say, verse 17, 19 and 20. Every member of this church of Christ, having children, are to bring them unto the elders before the church, who are to lay hands on them in the name of the Lord, and bless them in the name of Christ. There cannot be anyone received into this church of Christ who have not arrived to the years of accountability before God and are not capable of repentance. And the manner of baptism and the manner of administering the sacrament are to be done as is written in the Book of Mormon. So, so this is paired, so the beginning part here about the blessing of children and the sacrament of blessing of children is paired right away with baptism and confirmation uh, because of, uh, more or less, is, is saying here, we can't, you can't baptize babies, is the idea. So in other words, we have this age of accountability. So it's sort of pair the pairing here is to understood right from the start we baptizing only beginning at eight and so before that uh we will do a, a children's blessing a blessing of infants and children so this becomes a practice right away so some of the sacraments as we're doing the toolkit you'll know um are not immediately understood as sacraments at the beginning of the restored church so the evangelist blessing only comes later for example i mean in the first few years of the church but not right away uh, the blessings of children happen immediately. That's one becomes a regular practice. It's a practice that is sometimes done in, in its own service, and it's sometimes done as uh, part of a regular another church service, a communion service, and it's sometimes part done even in, in a conference of the church. And so it didn't have to be done as its own separate service, but sometimes it is. So Reynolds Cahoon, an early member of the church, notes in his diary in 1831, he says, Saturday evening, we had a meeting with the brethren at Mr. Reeves and blessed the children in the name of the Lord and sealed the church unto eternal life. A couple of years later, Orson Pratt, also in his diary, remembered or recorded, being the Sabbath, we held a meeting in the forenoon and also one in the afternoon, and Brother Lyman ordained Brother Horace Cohen, an elder, and laid hands upon the little children and blessed them in the name of the Lord and administered the sacrament. Um, likewise, then a few years later, 
at Far West, the minutes of a church conference that was held there on April 6th, 1838 reads, in part, the meeting adjourned for one hour. And again, it was opened by David W. Patton, one of the apostles, after which the bread and wine was administered and 95 infants were brought forward and blessed. So anyway, so they're doing that, including kind of doing it all together, like they did with uh, in the example in the Book of Mormon. All of these um, uh, uh, examples were found in Greg Prince's book, which is called, uh, you maybe seeing it here, Power from on High. Um, this is a really important in terms of, uh, you know, resource uh, that Greg Prince has written that it talks about the uh, development and origins of uh, priesthood offices and practices in the early church period. So anyway, good book and resource for that. So um, part of the context for doing this is some of the anxiety that early church members and indeed other contemporary Christians had at the time um, seeing, let's say, baptism as a saving ordinance. So um, the idea of it is that uh, a saving ordinance, if you understand it, that if we, it, as they were understanding, it means that in order to be uh, achieve salvation, in order to um, go to heaven and the afterlife, as opposed to, um, you know, be face damnation, um, you needed to have certain ordinances uh, in order to actually achieve salvation. And so um, there was a lot of anxiety if you if this particular ordinance was necessary, there's a lot of anxiety regarding every person who may have died without having been baptized. And so, for example, then, uh, especially in an era, which all eras were until the present day, um, uh, where children died in infancy very, very frequently. Um, a lot of times we, we talk about the uh, Middle Ages and ancient times and in the early modern period, we talk about uh, people's life expectancy being so low. And we'll say, you know, if you were born in ancient times or something like that, you, your life expectancy, you know, was 25 or something like that. The, um, that's an average life expectancy. So if you actually, if you get to be 25 or whatever, you're not likely to drop dead the next day or something like that. But the point of it is, is that uh, you, you're very, you can compl completely live on to being like 90 or so. There are a lot of people who did live uh, into old age, although it was not as frequent to live that old, you know, more likely to live into your 60s or something like that. But the, um, the life expectancy is so low because so many people died as babies, so many people died in early childhood, so many people died as teenagers and so forth. So, um, so life expectancy and child mortality, uh, infant mortality and childhood mortality were extremely high. Uh, and so you had to have multiple, many more children than, than two just to achieve replacement rate in all of antiquity in the Middle Ages. And so there's, if you are not, um, if you, on the one hand, have decided that, um, that baptism is a saving ordinance, in other words, essential to salvation, and you don't baptize anybody, let's say, until, uh, let's say you're making a believer's adult baptism, um, this is going to just cause a crazy amount of anxiety because so many of the so many people are never going to have been baptized. Um, you know, essentially all of these children, half of all children, or more than half of all children, and so uh, and so this um, and so even if you are doing infant baptism, there's a lot of babies that are you know going to die before um, before that's even possible, and that also is a cause for anxiety if you are. Uh, deciding, like I say, that it's essential to salvation that, that this ordinance has been performed. And so, um, and so as a result of that, um, you know, anxiety among Christians, um, some Christian theologians formulated this hypothetical eternal state for unbaptized children called limbo. So in a sense, this is uh, intellectuals coming up with a solution that maybe is a helps them figure things out, but I think it was not particularly, um, uh, I don't think it necessarily comforted parents too much, <laughs> but effectively the idea of it is that um, uh, that parents, you know, parents were anxious because they think that this unbaptized infant or child that they have now is going to be consigned to hell, um, and that's of course terrible. Uh, and so then theologians will say, well, I mean, there's, a ch uh, infant is not able to 
have committed sins in, in any kind of way. And so therefore they won't be achieved damnation for that. So they will have this state, eternal state called limbo. And we still have the word limbo, meaning, you know, when you're in limbo, you're neither here nor there. So you're not going to be in heaven. You're not going to be in hell. You're with all of these little babies, you know, essentially in, in this limbo state. Um, and I think that that may, may have made theologians satisfied in some cases because they like logic. But I think that a lot of parents are like, wait a second, my, I'm going to be in, if I'm hopefully going to be in heaven, <laughs> you know, but all of these, uh, you know, children that I lost are going to be in limbo. Where, where is that? That's not a, um, it's not a particularly comforting idea. And so that's in, been a point of anxiety. And I think in general, it's not a popular notion. I think the Catholic Church has rejected recently the idea that limbo is exists and, and that kind of a thing. That that's a uh, the doctrine or the theological idea of it has more or less been abandoned, mostly. But it might still exist for some Christians and so forth. Um, but the the concern over infants uh, and young people, people who hadn't been baptized, baptized, you know, it's strong enough in the Restoration tradition um, that they uh, that they start begin this idea of a practice of a baptism for the dead, right? So in other words, they do proxy baptisms in Nauvoo for people who died at any age without being baptized. And again, that's born out of a concern that if that baptism is essential for a person to have been saved, what if all the people, um, what, if, what about all the people who didn't have the opportunity? Um, is what they had in their minds uh, on that kind of a thing. So I think that the problem there is is making the making this logical leap that baptism is essential for salvation. That nobody who has on the earth who hasn't been baptized is can, will be able to be saved. Um, I I I think that um, we you got, again. I'm not going to I'm not redoing your your lecture you've already had on baptism. But I think that our understanding in community of Christ is that. Um, that baptism is a saving ordinance in the sense that um, it is an expression of us, uh, you know, aspiring to salvation and that sort of a thing. And it is a, a, an ordinance and a sacrament that is extremely meaningful in the life of the disciple. Uh, and it is part of the experience of salvation. But it doesn't mean that everybody who doesn't experience it um, is not going to be saved, but rather it is part. So it's like a plus and instead of, you know, that or, or else kind of thing. Um, so I think that in part, um, uh, a lot of this is uh, born out of confusion of the idea of original sin and what original sin is meant to be. So the restoration um, rejects the idea of uh, original sin in the 1830s. And so um, there is one of the uh, epitomes of faith, also called the articles of faith, one of the epitomes of faith is that we believe that uh, a man will be punished for uh, his own sins and not for the transgression of Adam, which is to say, um, this is an, an understanding that early restoration members had of the idea of original sin, which is to say that humanity is in a sinful condition because of the very first sin that was introduced in Eden. In other words, that sin is introduced into the world when that happened. And so, um, you know, anyway, there is an anxiety that since everyone is in a sinful condition, including children, that if, again, if they die without having baptism somehow remove their sin or whatever, that, that this would um, mean that they're going to achieve damnate or be damned for no fault of their own, which obviously doesn't seem like any kind of theological fairness. And it's not a, a doctrine that anybody, I think, likes to try to, um, uh, to defend. And so it was one that the early members uh, rejected. Um, I feel like that, uh, that in general, that this is a, um, a misunderstanding of what the idea of original sin should, should be. I think that a lot of people do misunderstand this. And I think that actually even denominational doctrines misunderstand this. Um, on, the, on the one hand, uh, I, in Christianity, I think the idea of is is that you're not actually rewarded for good deeds or punished for your sins in any events. So in other words, much less Adam's sins. Uh, so that's not what um, that's not what salvation. You know, that's not what salvation actually is. Is in terms of um, us adding up all the good deeds and saying, okay, well, you that outweighs the bad deeds, and so therefore you make it in. You know, that's um, that would be uh, uh, that would lead to a faulty motivation. 
Um, so it has like, for example, in the in the parable, it, as Jesus has the parable of the goats and the lambs. Um, one of the points of the goats is, is that they did not know when they had been, when they had helped Jesus, right? So in other words, part of the idea of it is that they, they helped him, um, you know, what, they helped the, you know, the sick, they did all of these things, they were doing those actions, but they didn't know that they were doing it to Jesus, and they weren't doing it for the idea of a reward, that would be, that would be giving them a tainted uh, motivation. So in other words, you would be acting as a mercenary, you're only doing good because you want to be rewarded, or you're scared of hellfire, or something like that, a tainted motivation, and, and lots of um, Christian Theology, unfortunately, I think, does make this misunderstanding, and as a result, people do have that tainted motivation, um, which is not, which is kind of alien, I think, to the the actual intent of the theology. So, likewise, um, original sin shouldn't be the idea that, uh, in any event, that people, all of us, are under some kind of condemnation or punishment because of something um, Adam and Eve, you know, you said effectively, actually, mythically, did in in Genesis. But rather, it is a, a, a theological way that we kind of are understanding the human condition. So the human condition that we are all born into is a state of imperfection, right? So we are in a state in our mortal frame um, of where we are, we are um, more or less um, divided from God, you know, where we are not um, in an eternal state where we are one with God, which is what we uh, hope for in in salvation, but rather we're in a condition where the world is filled with suffering and evil, and we are having those kind of experiences. And so the idea of original sin is 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 the idea of explaining uh, the mortal condition of the world that we just find ourselves in, as opposed to, um, like I say, meaning that everybody is going to be damned because of that. Um, that's not, I think, the, the understanding of it, although I can understand why people have, have kind of taken it to that way. So um, in all of these things, then, you know, that I just want to have as kind of context for how um, this particular sacrament um, maybe had its origin and why it became a part of our tradition going all the way back to the beginning. But I also um, will say, you know, with that as kind of a context, um, in some, that this continues to be um, very meaningful in the life of the church today. So just by way of um, just the tidbit tips on how to do this, you know, in, in, in practical tips, you know, so this is a sacrament that's administered by elder or high priest. Like I said, it's often a standalone service, but it doesn't have to be. We did ours um, last month as a standalone service. Uh, um, any children who are under the age of eight are eligible for the blessing with the consent of their guardian. So it doesn't have to be limited. It's not a thing that is limited to, um, to children of members of the church. And so I know uh, I was in England and they were talking about, and a congregation, and they were talking about how um, providing blessings of children to non-members in the neighborhood is actually one of the um, open kind of outreach and invitational uh, um, ministries that the congregation provides to their neighbors um, and that, that is welcomed by some of their neighbors in, in the, the tradition. Um, other than indicating that it should be brief, the priesthood manual doesn't give a formula. There's no formula for this, um, although they note that it often includes uh, giving the child's name. So Sometimes in the tradition, it was called, we give you a name and a blessing or something like that. And so it's equivalent to like a naming service. Um, and I was thinking, I don't know, I was, gonna, I, was I, I could, I, was, I have the blessing that we gave on, on last month. And I was wondering if it makes it appropriate to read it as an example, but maybe I won't do that because it's a, an individual blessing, but essentially it's not that it's not, uh, it, it's not, it wasn't long, but it's essentially, um, you know, we say the child's name, say as elders of the church, we lay our hands and offer a blessing in, in Jesus name. And then we talk about the, talk about the idea of it and just the, the loving support and raise the, um, the, the co congregation and the family are covenanting to, covenanting to in raising this child uh, as part of a, this loving community. And so that's kind of how we, how we did that. So as I say, it was a really wonderful and blessed event in the life of our congregation and um, can be obviously in yours as well <laughs> when that happens. And so 
Um, that was my thoughts and reflections on that. And so we can probably move on to questions and answers. I'll stop the share here. Thanks so much, John. I really uh, appreciate that. And that's really wonderful to get all of that historic um, information and, and how intrinsically connected this sacrament is actually to baptism and, and uh, our understanding of baptism too. Um, yeah. it, we'll open this up to question and answer. If you want to come off of mute and ask questions of John, you can also put them in the chat if you feel more comfortable that way. And I will watch the chat to be able to help with that. I have a question. Uh, John, in the listing of the eight sacraments, you mentioned the one which we normally call administration to the sick, simply as laying on of hands. Yes. I like the way you separated it out in the significance of the eight uh, sacraments in putting its uh, laying on of hands for personal needs. But in the original list where you have the uh, icons, it, it seems it needs something since two or three of the other ordinances sacraments also have laying on of hands you're you're right yeah that slide <laughs> i agree with you that slide um my problem is that's a long <laughs> name <laughs> you know so so yeah so it, so i mean it gets cut off there because i mean in other words you, ordination has got one word marriage you know, i mean it's pretty easy but this is laying on hands for you know uh for uh, healing and or you know laying on hands for you know and then also um and like you say in parentheses administration um so we we kind of use our our technical term for that is administration like you were saying and and i certainly will still use that term the 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 thing about it is um so I, I the reason why i didn't immediately call that administration in my chart is because when i was reading the history of this i was realizing that um that all of the all of the times when they have priesthood people in priesthood uh, performing a sacrament they calling it administering a sacrament and so and so actually they were administering they were talking about like administering the sacrament and they meant when they say that they didn't mean the the sacrament of administration they meant communion <laughs> you know and so and so and so um and so yeah i mean I'm, I'm, so i agree with you though that i that that abbreviation is insufficient in that list. So yeah, I should change that. I would also like, uh, <laughs> I was surprised at your approach to this topic today. And it's one of the reasons I wanted to be here. Okay. I have been impressed with your invitational ministry on the Beyond the Walls, which I have not seen since April when I started back in person church. Yes. But, your your openness and invitation and the thoroughness completeness with which you explain things is just so welcoming to people i appreciate that oh thank you so much thank you for that um response i hope uh i hope there was if there, the, the was understandable this time too in terms of going through the background in this presentation as well this one is um uh, one of the i think more complicated, you know, uh, sacraments to get into in a sense because we um, people wrote less about it, you know. In other words, some of these, um, so some of these, you know, there's some big arguments about baptism, as I kind of alluded to in this, you know, that Christians have had. Whereas, whereas this one is a special um, sacrament that is pretty unique to our tradition, um, and it's really a joyous one that I have a te real testimony of. Um, and yet, and yet we don't have a, there's not a lot written about it, <laughs> you know, so, so that was, so it was interesting to prepare this. One, one of the things I would, uh, just wanted to add to this is, you know, um, everyone here, uh, in this forum knows that I grew up in the LDS tradition and I came in uh, just a couple of years ago to community of Christ. And so I've seen this uh, sacrament uh, performed in both traditions uh, many, many times. I have come from a numerous family with my own brothers and sisters and, you know, those kinds of things. Of course, I don't remember my own, obviously, uh, my own naming and blessing, but uh, it's always been a special one. But one of the things that uh, 
for our community of Christ um, context, something that's been very heartwarming to me in a lot of ways is A, because of priesthood um, being held by women in our tradition, being able to see mothers and grandmothers uh, bless their babies too, is incredibly emotional to me where that always had to be um, you know, a worthy male priesthood holder in the other tradition, which um, it, 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 there's just a lot more diversity and openness, I think, in, in Community of Christ. It's been a very a big blessing. And I also know the Community of Christ has a, a difficult time um, sometimes with our book of scripture, the Book of Mormon. But this is one of those things that comes from our tradition that connects us with that book of scripture too, and, and our origins as well. So I continue to be a person that advocates for new ways of using that book of scripture and, and uh, interpreting it and, and, and using it in our, our, our church life and our spiritual life. And I, I like when there are examples there that are concrete, that are important to us as a community that come from a place that cause sometimes some tension in our in our in our community, it, it means there's a place for it and uh, and a place for dialogue ar around it too. So those are just a couple of my comments. Yeah, the um, I mean, especially uh, important, I think, in terms of using you know using the Book of Mormon is that the Book of Mormon gives us a lot of insight into what the first members of Community of Christ were thinking about, because that is the book of Scripture that led most of them to join in the first place. And they were looking at it as it was immediately um, talking to their circumstances uh, at the time. And so, and so it's often a source um, when we were trying to figure out why did they do this? <laughs> you know, like, oh, well, I guess we need to go back to this text and start reading it again in order for uh, to understand that. And so that's important. Yeah, the, um, the LDS uh, tradition of the baby blessing is, um, ends up being different because of the difference in how priesthood works, you know? And so by making it priesthood in, in the LDS churches, not, not only all male, but it's, it's also all male. <laughs> and so, and so, and so we have a difference in ordination where ordination um, is not something that is all disciples in community of Christ um, you know, feel called to and, and, and nor uh, need to, you know, want to do. In other words, it's completely uh, a, a, an additional path, but it's not a, a path that is, let's say, essential or something like that. Um, in the same way, you know, a person can also live their entire life and never marry and so forth. You know, that's, uh, those are sacraments, um, but they are not, uh, you know, a disciple is um, a perfectly, um, meaningful role to maintain a community of Christ with not without, um, you know, having additional ordination or, or anything like that. Um, and so and so in this case, the because of that, uh, you know, whereas in the LDS church is automatic ordination of all males. And so uh, it's beginning at age 12. And so and so as a result of that, the practice is sort of usually done, I think, as a as a dad blessing kind of thing, where the dad and all the other men in the church are essentially taking the baby and blessing the baby, and the women are not, are, are are kept from that circle. Um, and so in this case, you know, it's just like it says in the uh, the original Doctrine and Covenants, where where we practice priesthood as only some people. It was male only, but anyways, only some people are called to different callings as adults, you know, and many of the, most of the people are disciples who are not in priesthood. And so that says, bring the child unto the elders of the church, the elders do the baptism, as opposed to, um, like you say, in this particular tradition and the way the LDS has evolved in the LDS, because of their understanding of priesthood, it has become kind of a dad, write a passage for dads <laughs> or something like that, or, you know, that kind of a thing, so. Oh, now Angela is saying ordination now begins at eleven. I did not know that. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, they changed it a couple of years ago. Okay, eleven is such a un, 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 unholy number. <laughs> so <laughs> probably, probably many probably many parents would agree with that. Yeah, <laughs> Go I would ahead, like to jump. I'd like to jump in at this time, and, I'm, and I, I can't give you an exact age, but as a marriage and family therapist, we learned about Erickson's stages of development. Yeah. And, and, and part of what happens around the age of eight is the independent thought. 
mm. that they're, you're not, they're not thinking their parents' thoughts. They're, they're beginning to try things on their own. And sometimes it may be the age of six sometimes, but, but, but it makes sense that that is an age where they're kind of making the decisions about doing right or wrong or, uh, and, and they're exploring it, you know? Yeah. So that, that makes sense. The other thing is a little humor I want to share with you, if I may, and be somewhat disruptive, but <laughs> my children are two and a half years apart. So my son was two and a half when his sister was blessed. And mm. she was blessed by, my, by a dear, we were lived in Southern Illinois. She was blessed by a dear uncle, Bill Rocket. And the pastor of the church was Charlie Miller. And Charlie was holding Kelly and, and my uncle Bill was offering the prayer and she cried the whole time. And my son was sitting with my parents at the time. And when he, they said, amen, Brad looked up and said, Charlie, you made her mad. <laughs> so, so that was, that was the last blessing that was, it was uh, given to Charlie. It was that man, you know, you didn't do a very good job because she is really mad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's wonderful. <laughs> my, my mom used to my mom used to say, Stephanie, that sometimes the the children's blessing was was probably actually an exorcism because you know, they're like screaming and don't want to <laughs> so. right. Well, she was a crybaby, but but my son's observation was right on. <laughs> Yeah, so I, obviously, I think like you say, um, it's a great point about eight, right? So in other words, this is a um, this is a period of time when children have more independence, and like you say, they're they're going to now have memories that they're going to remember. I think most everybody I can remember getting baptized at eight. I think it's something that um, when it's an important thing, people can remember it. Um, and they, and there could be, I think that there could be additional moments that are recognized if we wanted to, because I mean, I think if we so for example, if we we had made baptism to age 15 nobody'd ever get baptized <laughs> because that's when you that's when that's when kids really say no <laughs> to parents right <laughs> but but so one of the things that um you know like catholics do in uh you know is that they have like like from i think around age 12 you know or we could do 11 the unholy 11 anyway but anyway around age 12 is when you do a kind of a class and then you have confirmation class and so on and so and so one of the ways that you you, you we could theoretically, just using the same sacraments that we already have, we could engage, um, you know, younger teens, you know, uh, you know, if in a in a kind of a class or something like that. If we were to, let's say, start practicing confirmation at twelve, which is nothing stopping us from particularly doing that, but we don't do that right now. But anyway, that would be another because I do think that there's an additional age frame that starts happening in teenage years that could potentially be recognized in that, and then we'd have something nice to do. But we don't anyway. That's not our tradition right now, but it's also allowed. So. Do we have we have time for one last question? If does somebody have another concern or question or comment? I'll comment. Um, one of the things that you brought out in the presentation in the background, and I think it goes to community of Christ very well, is the need for the community to be involved in helping to raise that child. Yes. Yeah. In so the village. I totally agree with you. So in this blessing that we gave, it says, through this sacrament, we covenant before God to support you in your development and growth as an individual. May we, your family, your congregation, commit to nurturing you and your God-given potential. You know, so that was just part of the blessing because we wanted to also, like you say, Gail, affirm to the congregation that, that sacraments are, are also special community um, of blessings. In other words, the individual is, we're marking uh, off a, um, a moment in the individual's life, but we're doing that in community. Um, so, it, so I think that that's absolutely critical to our understanding of sacraments and community of Christ. Well, thank you again, everybody, for being with us this evening. John, thank you for being with us two times uh, this month in Community Circle. Um, I put a note in the chat. We hope that you all join us for our last sacrament. We've made it through all of the sacraments except uh, the last one, which will be on ordination. Uh, Kirsten Jeska from Norway, an evangelist in uh, Europe, will be the last presenter. Um, so we're really excited about it. And we'll be excited next month to tell you about the new series next year that we'll, we will be exploring uh, together, too. So uh, God bless you all. Thanks so much, John. Very quickly, thank you again. Very quickly. Yes. So